Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Danny Show. Today, I have a very special guest. His name is Peter Picaccian. So Peter Picaccian is a 34-year-old accounts payment manager at Sporting Life Group. He was newly elected president of the Red Patch Boys, one of the first original supporter groups of the Toronto FC Football Club. He is one of the coaches and head teachers at Kanzen Kai Karate, my old dojo I used to go to. He has been involved in soccer since he was four years old and started doing karate at the age of 10. Since joining the sport, Peter has gone on to win multiple national karate championships. He was on the junior team for three years and on the senior team for two years before hanging up the gloves to finish schooling due to sustaining injuries, unfortunately. But now he joins me live. How are you doing, Peter? I'm pretty good. How are you, Daniel? Good, good. Thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for having me. So uh, I can first off by uh, say what made you interested to pursue a career in karate? Uh, I was the age of 10 when I started. Uh, my mom just took me to get some self-defense. Mm -hmm. um, it was just to learn some self-defense, get active. I was always active as a kid. Uh, I did swimming since I was like the age of one with those baby classes. And then I moved on to doing soccer and skating, like ice skating for like the age of four or five. And then mm -hmm. karate was just the next sport that I just wanted to get interested in. And it was just a self-defense that turned into... Sensei Piru's uh, one of my first senseis at uh, Kanzen. He got he put gloves on my hands, and I just love to get into a kumite match, pretty much. <laughs> right, right, right. So like that that was your first and only dojo, Kanzen Kai. Yeah, it was. Oh. It was my first dojo, and for the first five years, my focus was literally on just learning Kanzen Kai, learning the katas, learning all the terminology, since uh, Sensei Piru's Shinan, and as well as Sensei Nassim, they were my mentors this whole time. And Sensei Shinan, uh, he was like a father figure to me during that time. So I was really like like trying to just learn as much as possible from him. So I got my black belt five years after. And cool. after that, I was competing pretty much nonstop on the national team, provincial team, and a few tournaments at, at international as well. That's pretty cool. That's really cool. So like, yeah. um, since you've been on both the provincial and national team, um, what type of like tournament kind of stood out to you? And like, what type of medal that did you win that like, okay, like I won one, now I can go on to win multiple ones, you know? Um, my big one was my first international tournament. I went to Chile, Santiago, Chile for the junior Pan Ams. Mm -hmm. um, went there as just first competition international i went to juniors i started a little late on the competing side of like provincial and national right uh, i was 18 for 18 20 i had made the team and not a lot of people knew who i was so it was really nice to prove my prove myself from all the training that i had done with so many senseis at the dojo and right. even across different dojos that i had trained with mm -hmm. uh, it showed on the ring at, in chile and i got my first medal there as a bronze medal yeah that's that's amazing to, to hear so now that you've like done all this karate and you know from a very young age to now whole journey um what's the biggest difference as you see as a sensei right now like a sensei compared to a student the, that that type of role that type of difference um i try not to make a difference from the role like when i had some i had I, I can't even, I lost count of how many senseis. I had so many different senseis right. uh, growing up. I had, I was really fortunate of having different senseis that mm -hmm. all beat me up because I was a big kid that looked like an adult, but I was just a kid at the age <laughs> of 14, 15. But that, that taught me a lot. So that got me a hard skin. Um, I just wanted to, it was, they always kept it fun. I was always learning new things, but I, they always kept it fun still. So I want to go back every day or I wanted to be there all the time. That was like my second home as a mm -hmm. kid or and even as a teenager that's so cool. i want to keep that with all my students when i'm ever teaching with like yourself or even so many other t uh, kids that i've taught since age of 16 i was teaching because i had high school just down the street from kanzen kai so i would just leave high school right after come over do some volunteering teach and then train myself in the, in the evenings mm -hmm. so it was just a routine for me and I've reached out, to, I've had like students like from 10, 15 years ago reach out to me saying, hey, thank you so much for what you've done for me. Or I've learned so much from you. I would love to just come back and see you all. And that's that's like my main thing is always want to keep that family growing. It's kind of hard now 
um, a lot of it's, I would say like the generation has changed a lot of teenagers, even kids, they mm -hmm. don't feel like they'll do it for a few years and then they'll just disappear and move on to the next step, which is fine. More mm -hmm. things you learn. That's totally right. fine with me. I'm always open to having a, someone like a student learn different aspects of tea. Like they want to do karate one time and then they'll want to do jujitsu and then they want to do MMA because that's the word at UFC. Oh, it's MMA, but really <laughs> MMA is a mix of different martial arts. Right. So I'm always open pushing them to learn different things. So one thing I brought up when I was as a student and then brought into being a teacher was just being like a brother or a sister, like a brother to my students. Like no. my little brother, I always say, I always like, they're, you're my little brother. Or mm -hmm. you're my little sister. That's how I felt, and I always made them like a family for me. But yeah, that, that's that's great that you come in with that mindset because not not a lot of senses. Because you know, karate and MMA and Taekwondo, these disciplines, they teach you discipline, and the senses don't mm -hmm. they don't mess around. And I'm not saying that you don't mess around. In general, <laughs> senses don't have that you know touchy kind of feeling, uh, one on one connection with a lot of their students. They want you to see them as a sensei, as mm -hmm. master and stuff, not that as much as their friend. But in mm -hmm. your case, when you give them that feeling of friendliness, it gives them more kind of momentum, more passion to come into the sport, which I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. and sidebar, uh, everyone, like uh, Sensei Peter knows me since I was eight years old when I started doing karate, so I'm eight to 12. And then when I joined back a couple years ago, so it's it's really cool to have you on the show, man. <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah. it's been a it's a journey. It's a good journey to see. It's a good journey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So kind of aside from karate now, our yeah. main focus for today the 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 Toronto FC. You're part of the Red Patch <laughs> Boys. Kind of talk about that experience. Um. So it was a very like funny experience how I got involved. I I love football. Like any sport, like soccer is my number one sport. To like in any sport I learned, that's like. The top 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 sport watch games on the weekends european mm -hmm. italian right english especially italian because i like the i like my team juventus and then obviously epl is always fun to watch mm -hmm. you can't complain with there um and then when when it got announced uh that toronto was going to get like a professional soccer team i was just ecstatic mm -hmm. i know it's not the same level it's american north american i know a lot of people would be like oh it's just north american soccer it's not the same it's getting there slowly, slowly, but mm -hmm. it was just having a home team in your own backyard that you can go watch professional soccer players. Some could be Canadian, some can be American, some can be European. Now there's a lot of players coming from Europe over, which is awesome. Right. It was just, I can support a team just, just down the street from, or like, I just have to take a bus right down and I can watch a professional soccer team. So when 2000 came around and TFC was um, a new team in the North American market, mm -hmm. And it was the first Canadian team in the MLS. I was just first person there. I was watching the games, enjoyed it. I wasn't a season holder yet. I was still a kid, so still wanted to enjoy it, but not go every game. And then it was second year university. I had a good friend of mine that was in soccer as well. He had tickets, and he's like, hey, you want to come watch a game? And I'm like, of course, why not? Mm -hmm. And he introduced me to the Red Patch Boys, and that was when I just was like, I fell in love. I was like, no, I want to be in this kind of crowd, like cheering on the team, being like that 12th man on the field that pushes your team to victory, or if they're right. losing, how to get them back to win. And right. from then on, I was just involved with the group, just going to small gatherings or painting TIFOs or painting banners, stuff like that. Those are small things. Right. And then it was... The year, I'm trying to remember what year it was, Stephen Badisher, another mm -hmm. fellow uh, Iranian and right. Assyrian. So he's like both both cultures of mine, Assyrian and Iranian, oh, cool. uh, joined yeah. the team. And I was just like, oh, this is it. I'm going to raise the Assyrian flag every game possible <laughs> and make sure he comes to our corner. Right. I was always in contact with him on Instagram. I was like one of those stalkers, but I wasn't like in a friendly way. <laughs> I try not to stalk him too hard, but it was just he was, such a friendly guy. And then I got to meet his family. It was the 2016, uh, 2016 playoff run in the finals when his family from San Jose came over mm. and they were like, 
they were in the party of like the pre-party and they realized my flag and they're like you're the guy that steven always talks about <laughs> I'm like, oh, i hope it's good things <laughs> that's, so that's amazing to hear you stalk yeah. him so hard that his family's like you're the guy <laughs> you're the guy with the flag in the corner the we were the in the, we were right in that corner so like when the camera is pointing towards 112 which is where there's like a nice little like Right now it's Mill Street, but before it was the Budweiser corner. Oh, right, we're right, right in that corner. That's right, our right. section. So, a lot of the times when there's corner corner kicks happening, we're always on camera. Oh, I see. I so see. yeah, and first few rows. That's how it was. And when I became a member, I worked my way in to get season tickets somewhere else, and then slowly moved in down to the supporters section. Just became more and more involved as much as possible, and then I became. It was like about five, six years ago became, or more, because this pandemic sort of adds time. <laughs> so right. I think it was like 2015. Yeah, let's say 2015, about nine years ago, I became like part-time drummer. I was able to drum the big uh, the big drummer that's, uh, the yeah. drum that's in, uh, Great. in the South End. And that was just, I just did it for fun here and there. And it was just, it's, it's nice hearing the whole South Side being all one and united it's mm -hmm. the best feeling ever and i know a lot of players when we talk to them that's all they they crave for is to see right. they hear that the whole south end mm -hmm. just roaring them through well that's that's amazing to hear like how you kind of immerse yourself in that environment and now that you've been in this environment uh what do you think about like tfc this season coming in i mean they got the tie against cincinnati which was great they look really good i think their rosters got a lot better than than yeah. last year a lot better but what's your perspective on tfc coming into the season um so about a week and a half ago i would say we're in really big trouble because there was no signings no nothing right and it was right. about three weeks ago we had a supporters forum so uh the coach uh, john herdman and the captain osorio he mm -hmm. invited all the supporters to come mm -hmm. uh, have like a little get together and ask questions Oh, and cool. talk to them it's nice yeah. they do it every year once in a while so last year was i think last year with some of the players coming a little later it changed aspect and it didn't work out but this year he john herbin just wanted to tell us what his vision is of the team mm -hmm. and we're like okay this is awesome like you're giving us exactly what you want the formations what kind of players you want now where are the players like we were we, like that was like a question i got <laughs> asked about two three times was like is there any transfers like is right. there someone coming are you are you watching the asian cup right now with all these great players are you watching the african cup there's so many good players like we don't have to go straight to the european market and pay right. lots of big bucks you can find right. like a lot of teams in mls they go to south america and have players come up play for a few years and then use that pathway into europe it's and I don't mind, yeah. like, we don't mind that. Like, we don't yeah. mind buying players and then selling mm -hmm. them. That's, mm -hmm. But it hasn't been a Toronto FC, um, I say focus. They just buy players and then hope to, like, if they retire, they retire. Like, that's how we look at the end of their career. Why not get some young players that would want to play here, right? I know it's cold to play some games in <laughs> Toronto in late February or March. It's pretty cold, but I'm sure they'll they'll enjoy playing here because of the crowd. Like a yeah. lot of players when we talk to them they're yeah, like for sure like, toronto is something else yeah so with a week and a half ago it was like okay are there's players coming or are we just going to play with the same team we had last year because there's no way we can do the things that he wants to do with the, the talent that we had on the roster at the moment we needed some veteran talent like there is like we have a lot of youth which is great but we need some veteran leaders as well so when some of the signings started showing up, we're like, okay, nice, nice. And then um, the big signing on Friday, this past Friday, with uh, Lorea coming back to Toronto, yeah. that was that was that, was, that was it. <laughs> that was huge. It was huge yeah. for him to come back. It was like awesome. Nottingham Forest finally yeah. let him go. I know. Brought him back yeah. to Toronto, and he used the John Herdman connection to come back. And we just you saw what? some good signs from that. So we're yeah. like, okay. Now let's see what the game's going to be like on Sunday. Yeah. And they started out well. Like, it was – I was like, okay, this team looks like they want to fight. Like, I don't mind. There were some yellows here and there. The referee was a little bit biased. But the team looked like they wanted to fight and yeah. show that they're not a pushover anymore. No, It was sure something that yeah. – it's something that John Herdman did with the Canadian national team. Back mm -hmm. when he took them over with the men's, they came out banging with like beating the U.S. team and going, okay, 
And we're all like, oh, okay, this team isn't here to just joke around and just be a pushover. Like, and he's bringing that to Toronto FC, which was nice to see. So it was a good, it was a good result for a weight team. And we had about like 60, 70 people go over to watch the game. There was about 10 of our members actually went there. So it was nice seeing some of our work, uh, getting them away tickets. It was nice to see that too. Right. But, well, that's, that's amazing to hear, man. Like, I really do think Canadian sport teams in Toronto are just getting more Canadian. John Herdman is the national team coach for Team Canada <laughs> and the head coach of TFC. We got Kelly Olenek, Boucher, and Barrett on the Raptors. What's going on? Yeah. It's like, oh, Canada, like 2.0. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, we, we should use it because especially in MLS, they have that rule with the international spots and Canadian players. So if you're a Canadian player, you don't take up an international spot. There's yeah, so many right. little things in MLS that mm -hmm. I even get confused on all the rules. But like seeing Canadians on a team, it's it's great because at least it gets them started for the 2026 World Cup as well. Right. Yeah, I think I think getting I think. I think John Herman wanted to do that. I think it's like good publicity to because we're having that 26 World Cup here mm -hmm. for the first time in Canada. That's really huge for, for us as a nation. And to have it as like the first co-joining one with America mm -hmm. and Mexico, I think that's more special than what it could mm -hmm. be. So that's really cool, like how that 2026 World Cup is coming and how we kind of establish ourselves as a pretty good nation to compete at such a high level with us just being at the Qatar World Cup in 22. I feel like if we didn't qualify, we would be like, oh, like they're just in it because they just are the host. But now like we actually have a solid team. Like mm -hmm. Alfonso Davies just verbally agreed today to join Real Madrid either in 24 and 25. Huge. And that's huge. huge. He's a, our left back of Team Canada and he's arguably the best left back in the world and he's Canadian. Like that's huge. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So it's it really big moves. His uh, his presence from like the Whitecaps moving on to like Bayern Munich, right? Start sparked a lot. We had a lot of Canadians in the European market, but it wasn't as big as this one. No. And then when this happened, more names like Jonathan David came out, like playing in the League One. Stacchio playing in uh, Porto. Uh, it's sorry. Yeah, playing in Porto. Yeah, so it's like Porto, yeah. our names are like getting bigger and bigger. And then now a lot of Canadians are just focusing on getting on just even like before it was just the focus. Oh, we want to get to the top, like the top five leagues. No, just get your foot into any any of the leagues in Europe and you have a chance. Like Buchanan, he played in ah, Belgium. Buchanan. And now now he's playing in Serie A with Inter Milan. That's, that's like, huge. That's... That was a smart move what he did. So no, like a guy, a kid from Brampton is playing on Inter Milan. Like yeah. these names are just getting out there. I'm waiting for someone to like from Mark from <laughs> Richmond all to show up on yeah. like the big screen, you know. But yeah, it's like, astonishing how so many players, like even at the World Cup, so many players shine for us. Even like mm -hmm. uh, Johnson, Johnston, the the defender, yeah. he's on Celtic yeah. now. He's in the yeah. Scottish league, you know, making a name for himself and. You know, there's so many incredible players all around D D uh, Alfonso Davies. Mm -hmm. that Alfonso Davies is our, our superstar. I'm not saying he's not our superstar, but there's so many other stars in that team. And I'm like, wow, like this is a team now. Before it was only like one player carrying us, right? Yeah, exactly. But mm -hmm. now it's like a full unit. And that's, that's amazing because for so many years, Peter, you know this, Canadian sports was looked at as like, funny comedy for all these other teams um we were known as a hockey nation not even a basketball nation basketball is our sport we invented it but we do we, we defined that with the we the north movement with drake and you know yeah, yeah. like toronto's sports in general have, have gotten better in way way more aspects than just baseball and hockey basketball and soccer now is more popular i think than hockey and baseball which is pretty cool because we were in hockey nation Mm -hmm. yeah oh it's, it is it's it's awesome um uh, world cup was just like a, a ticking bomb to just pushing us over the edge and also getting the cpl league going in cpl that, right. was, that was huge like that's i know like all the background of like the cbsa and like the cpl and like all the like all the mess that's happening right now with just the canadian soccer association i hope that gets cleared up hopefully very soon because we need we need that league. We need support for our players, women's and men's. It's it's 
when I saw like all that commotion of like, oh, we're not getting support for us, or we're not getting support for our families going to the World Cup or going to the Olympics, it just recalled back to when my days at, as karate and athlete, we didn't get funded unless you were only meddling at a certain point, you were getting like a minimal funding. And then from that, you had to go to like almost every tournament and you had to like medal or like score some points so that you keep your status. And if you did, you keep going. But then if you're not getting funded enough, that means you have to work. And if mm -hmm. you got to work, how are you going to take time off? Because work right. wants you to be there and saying, so if you're like, oh, this week, I'm, I got to go off for work again. And if you're taking a part-time job, they'll be like, no, you got to work weekends and all. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of hard. So when I saw Canadian, like a soccer team, like a Canadian soccer team representing the country, having issues of funding, I was like, wow, like we're in a really bad spot with like just sports in general. Like right. I know Olympic athletes, like I know from different sports, mm -hmm. they also have issues with like getting funding. And it's like, this is sad. Like you're comparing it to a lot of like smaller countries around the world. Mm -hmm. One example is uh, uh, Iran. Like I have like a cousin that was on sports. Like, like they do well, they get paid well, or they'll get a car or they'll get a home. And it's <laughs> like, well, <laughs> and like, why can't we do that with some of our athletes? Like <laughs> it's a right. big incentive there, right? Like if I yeah. have an incentive that if I win a gold medal, I'm going to get like a nice home at the end of it. Okay. I can take some time off for work or like quit my job and just focus on that certain sport right. for like two, three years. If I'm yeah. going to get home at the end of it. <laughs> like, yeah, so, yeah. 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 It's interesting. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. But kind of going back in time and history and looking at this franchise, TFC kind of came out of nowhere, like to just establish mm -hmm. themselves as kind of like a really good team. Like before, I remember when I was a kid, because I, I, I grew up mm -hmm. watching TFC, I, I didn't go to every game, but I, I'm always their supporter. Um, but. Growing up, I watched how when Jermaine Defoe and Michael Bradley joined the team when I was a kid, that kind of redefined like our whole kind of franchise mm -hmm. when those two players came because a lot of players after that came and we won the championship. And then yeah. it was pretty cool how we got like players like Jovinko to come, Pozuelo. Um, and now we have, you know, a pretty good team with Larea coming back and stuff. So I hope they do well this season. I hope so too. I, I I see that we need a few more pieces to complete mm. the puzzle for sure. Right. Right. Um, if you look back at our 2015, 2016, 2017 team, mm -hmm. that was a really complete team. We had a we had some youth on the bench coming off. Yeah, well, that was a like complete team, yeah. Complete team from the back to the like to the front. I think our weakest link, even though he was amazing, like Alex Bono or Clint Irwin. They were yeah. both great for us, but those yeah. guys were our weakest link. Like right. we had an amazing back four, we had experience, we had strength on attacking, and then we had an amazing midfield and mm -hmm. then attacking of Josie Altador and Jovinko. It's like Bradley. You like... couldn't. You couldn't. Yeah, you had Bradley with Marky Delgado and Osorio playing in that midfield yeah. pairing, which was super strong, yeah. and also some like Jeru from the French league and right. Mavinga from the French league was playing in the back. Like we had some strong pieces, like mm -hmm. it was just strong everywhere. And then a lot of our youth built off of that, but the problem was some of those youth left. So this team sort of had like right now the like this pandemic and like the teams right now, it's a little bit like a rebuild year, right. except the rebuild was done incorrectly a couple of years ago with just mm -hmm. only bringing two, pe two people and expecting mm -hmm. the team's going to be amazing. Like those see. two players are great. And I know people like don't like they think, oh, they're at the end of their career. Yeah, sure, they are at the end, but Bernadeschi is the same, pretty much was the same age as when Jovinko came here. And he had the same story as playing on the bench at Juventus and he wanted to just prove himself. And when when he was signed, I was like, Oh my god, we just got another Jovinko, except mm -hmm. probably even more like just on a midfield side of things or on the wing. Yeah, so right. I can't wait to see that. In Signe, same thing. I was like, wow, we just landed one of like the top players from the Italian Euros just yeah. before that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He had some injury issues. It's just last year, the whole team in Toronto obviously had injury issues. So yeah. that's a whole different situation over there. But in Toronto I think... teams just have injury issues <laughs> in general. Yeah, our sports, our, our medical team of sports is just brutal. I don't know. Like, I'm not sure why they don't, they don't go to like University of Toronto. They have a great sports medicine program. Like, <laughs> grab, some, grab some students from there. Like, we need some new blood or something. Right, right. <laughs> right, right. I couldn't agree more. But yeah, uh, Peter, two last questions yeah, and then we'll wrap things up. 
So um, you're working at Sporting Life Group. How was that experience for you? Um, it's been amazing. Honestly, I was, I, this dropped in my hands. It was while I was trying to search for a new, was it a new job, like still in the same industry of finance. And it's just, this opportunity came up and it was like a hush hush. Like I didn't know what company I was looking at. It was just, they said, it's, they're just looking for an accounts payable manager. Mm -hmm. um, it's a youthful uh, organization. It's like the team is very youthful. And would you, are you interested? Here's an interview. And then when it was during the interview process, they were like, oh, like, how are you into like sports and stuff? And in my head, I'm going, oh, it's just like something related to sports. I'm like, wow. Like I've been in sports since I was two, three years old. And now I'm finally like, I'm starting a career, like starting a new position. Hopefully if I get it, it's in the sports industry. It's the retail side of things, but it's still sports related. And um, when I got in there, like the first week, everyone was so like friendly, young, there was some like, oh, but everyone was like talking about sports or they had some interest in sports or they played sports. So it's like, it's really nice. Like, especially when they had the, the Blue Jays run at the end of last year, it was just, everyone was just talking about Blue Jays. Oh, like, are they going right. to make it? They're not going to make it. Right. And then Sporting Life, they're also partner, like their sister company is Golf Town. So a lot of golfers at our mm -hmm. thing. And it was just something I started taking up uh, about three years ago. And I think a lot of people started taking that up during the pandemic. It was the only sport you can technically play when everything was closed. So that was one thing that really got me going. And then it was just golf. And then now we have like a new uh, store that just opened up in Mississauga and now opening up in Whitby. It's Team Town Sports. It's to get some um, leverage, uh, like get some more equipment for sports that are team related. Like there is sport check, but it's when you go in, there's only like, three, three, four shoes. And right. this store has like a wall of it. Right. Um, hopefully someone, whoever wants to thing, you can always reach out to me about that store. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a commercial, <laughs> but <laughs> we'd love to get people into those stores. They're only in Mississauga and Whitby right now, but it's, it's mm -hmm. a growing, it's going to be a store that if anyone wants some soccer shoes or stuff like that, they can go into those stores, nice. not just specialty stores. That's amazing because yeah, every time I go, it's more yeah. winter winter gear. Being pushed yeah, that's what sporting. Everyone. So that's the thing. That's what sporting <laughs> life is known for, but right. it is more. Sporting life now is more to like just day to day life, like casual wear for mm. sure, and also like sports. Like sporting life is more on like the skiing and the rowing, yeah. and, like the outdoors, like those yeah. like outdoor experiences. Golf town is all about golf. Right. And our team town sports is all about anything soccer, football, basketball, right? Cricket, baseball, like anything sport, like team related, they have. So. Got it. Got it. No, that's an amazing experience. And I'm yeah. glad you, you like it and enjoy yeah. it. Uh, one last question. Um, yeah. So uh, any advice you like to give to any aspiring uh, soccer students or karate students <laughs> trying to make a name for themselves? Um, take your experiences from sports or work or even just friendship and you never know what experience you learn from those will come ahead in like in the future. Like a lot of my karate experience, like, like time management, discipline, all that, it shows when I'm working. Like I'm like very like particular on time management. I always tell some of my students, like I will, I'll say her name because she knows who I'm talking about. Samira Levy's, you know her Samira as well, Sensei Samira. Sure. Sure. She always is like, oh, I don't have great time management. I'm like, you need to like focus on that. That's something that you learn from karate. Mm. It'll, it'll help you in your schooling and all that. And also don't quit on the first failed attempt. Right. Like hurdles are the best thing possible for you. I know some people go, oh, I need to have like a perfect straight line to success. No, you need to have that rocky up and down, up and down, up and down. You actually learn a lot more when you fall and get yourself picked up and go up from there. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Can't couldn't agree more with you. I feel like, like I said in our, in the early parts of our interview, um, mm. I was a, I was a karate student. I, you you were my teacher. Um, karate, if I didn't go when I was a kid, I feel like that discipline would just fade away. I think karate teaches you discipline, but that discipline carries on to so many more mm -hmm. aspects of your life. I remember when I was a kid, I was disciplined. Like, I remember, like, I have to wake up, go to school, do this, do that. I was, you know, putting yourself in a schedule. And when I 
kind of put karate aside when I was a kid in my teenage years, I was very undisciplined. And I mm -hmm. saw that negative ripple effect. Like, oh my God, I was thinking negative. I was lacking in school, lacking in grades and stuff. But I don't know, like karate, when I joined back a couple, like a few years ago, and I got back into that discipline mindset, it just worked wonders. I was doing well in school, being mm -hmm. more positive, being more social. And I feel like discipline in general, no matter what aspect it is, aside from karate, teaches you how to manage your life and be more productive and just optimize any single thing that comes your way, which I love. Yeah, I agree with that. It's, it's, that's awesome. Yeah. I, any oh. martial arts, I, I don't even say like only karate, any martial arts. Yeah, for sure. Especially whoever's listening, uh, if you have kids and stuff, put them into more, any martial arts. Yeah, it's, for sure. Mm -hmm. You learn a lot as a kid. And when you get, when you grow up, you can pick it up as becoming more professional or you just pick it up as a, just an exercise. It's yeah, great exercise. exercise. Well. It's something on the side to keep you disciplined. Yeah. I think it's beautiful. Well, mm -hmm. Peter, thank you so much for coming on the show. Peter Picaccian, you can follow him on his Instagram page. I'll put his link in the description down below for you to go and follow him. Peter, Sensei Peter, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Daniel, for having me. No problem. Have a nice day. Take care. Have a great night. Bye now. Bye-bye.